the US Civil War was a cruel and ruthless conflict. Men fought their fellow countrymen in some of the most bitter and brutal clashes in US history, which resulted in the loss of 625,000 lives. More American fatalities than the total for World War I and World War II. Initially, no one glimpsed the level of devastation. Imagining the conflict would be quickly resolved. Some people reacted flippantly, as if it were a game or a spectator sport. Here are some barely known incidents that indicate people's expectations until the somber truth of the reality of the war set in. The Congress. In 1858, a political skirmish in the US Capitol gave the nation an early preview of the conflict. Congress had debated the statehood of Kansas over days of arguments. The state's proposed constitution allowed slavery and prohibited free blacks from residing in the state, angering the Northern Republicans. The debate wore on past midnight, with both parties starting to drink heavily to stay awake. At 1.30am, Lawrence Kite, a highly intoxicated Democrat, stood up and accused Republican Galusha Grow of being a black Republican puppy. Grow retaliated with racist threats, whereas Kate lunged at Grow, shouting more threats, and the whole assembly erupted into ferocious brawling. In an attempt to quieten the affray, the Speaker of the House began to hammer the House mace, but this only increased the unrest. One congressman interpreted the Speaker's action as condoning the use of weapons. He seized the metal spittoon and brought it down on another politician's head. The brawl became serious when someone gripped William Barksdale in the headlock and made repeated blows to his skull. Barksdale escaped, but his wig had come adrift. The embarrassed man rescued it from the floor, but replaced the hairpiece on his head back to front. The house exploded into laughter, and the politicians finally calmed down. The scuffle ended, and they were finally able to come to an agreement. A man's wig had broken the tension of the hostilities. The First Battles War was to break out soon after this on July 2nd, 1861. 30,000 Union soldiers were dispatched to Centerville, Virginia, to await the fight of the First Battle of Bull Run, also called the Battle of First Manassas by the Confederate soldiers. The battle was only a short distance from Washington, D.C., and for the residents there, it presented itself as good entertainment. This was still at the beginning of the war, and the public were convinced that the Union would win a quick victory without loss of life, so decided a harmless pastime would be travelling out to watch the war. At sunrise, a menagerie of carriages and wagons streamed to the battlefield, where they positioned themselves on the side of a hill to get a good view. One woman was even using opera glasses and, as the battle started, let out an excited little comment of, That is splendid! and Oh my! Is that not first rate? Having an audience also inspired some of the soldiers to approach the spectators and provide a running commentary on the battle's progress. Some civilian onlookers became so fascinated that they tried to get a close vantage point on the battlefield itself. However, it soon became obvious that the Confederates were gaining the advantage, and a cavalry charge stormed some civilians who had become too close. Some were taken as prisoners, while others were not seen again. Overwhelmed by panic, the onlookers had to run and fled back to the capital. War Elephants Prior to the war, King Rama IV of Siam had become aware that America did not have elephants. The helpful king felt that this was a great loss that needed to be remedied post-haste, and when the Civil War began, he rose to the occasion. He wrote to Abraham Lincoln, with the offer of as many war elephants as were required. His letter explained that these would not only help him quell the Confederates, but could also undertake construction work or just be set loose to populate the forests. The President was at great pains to politely decline the King's offer, writing back, I appreciate most highly Your Majesty's tender of good offices. Our political jurisdiction, however, does not reach a latitude so low has to favour the multiplication of the elephant. It could be speculated, however, that a few years later, Lincoln 
may have been regretting not enlisting some elephants for the front lines. Coffee. Coffee was an everyday and essential part of a soldier's life, and regular supplies were a serious business, particularly for the Union side. The word coffee recurs in Union letters and diaries with more frequently than any other word. Even topics like war, bullet, Lincoln and mother. Each soldier was granted a ration of 16 kilograms or 36 pounds of coffee for the year and the beverage was consumed every morning. One rifle manufacturer even produced a rifle with a coffee grinder built into the stock. Because most troops were engaged in fighting for only two weeks per year, the coffee grinder component was usually kept busier than the weaponry mechanisms. By contrast, the Confederates usually had a coffee shortage due to Union blockades. Some Confederate men were craving a caffeine fix so desperately that they brewed potatoes and rye until they blackened in colour just to have a strong, bitter drink that emulated the taste of coffee, but unfortunately was caffeine-free. The addictive substance seemed to have strategic effectiveness in the war. One Union general would schedule his forays according to when his soldiers were at their highest caffeine levels in the belief that the extra buzz from coffee gave them more energy and determination. Disease While the troops spent most of their time waiting rather than fighting, they were still subject to a greater risk than the enemy in the Civil War, that of disease. The unhygienic living conditions of war camps allowed illnesses to proliferate, in the end causing nearly twice as many casualties as the armed conflict. The most lethal condition was diarrhoea, in particular from dysentery. This illness downed as many men as the act of combat. It was such a predominant issue that the authorities set a gentleman's code of battle. If any soldier was attending to the imperative calls of nature, the other side was prohibited from targeting him. The problem gave rise to an expression still used today, you have to have good guts to be a soldier. When the Civil War soldiers invented the saying, they were not referring to bravery. In this conflict, anyone who could not stave off diarrhoea would not last very long. The fight. During a skirmish at Saunders Field, the Union and Confederate troops both paused the onslaught to watch two soldiers sparring. Union forces had got the advantage on the Confederates, and in alarm, one of the men had leapt into a gully to take cover. However, he found that a Union soldier was already hiding there, so that the two men, fighting for opposing forces, were sheltering in a hole together. The two soldiers started arguing. Each man was quite sure that he had caught the other, but they were unable to agree on who was the captor and who the captive. They decided to settle the argument with what they called a regular fist and skull fight. On observing the two soldiers emerging from the gully and engaging in fisticuffs, protagonists on both armies were so perplexed that they lowered their weapons. For a few minutes, both sides were symbol spectators as the men fought it out. The Confederate soldier finally downed the Union man, who gave in, and the two men, now in agreement on the winner, returned to their hiding place. After this, the battle resumed, with the two feisty men hiding in the gully together until the skirmish had concluded. Then, true to his word, the Union soldier emerged as the other's prisoner. Tickets Elmira Prison in New York was notorious for being one of the harshest prison camps in the war. It had been planned with the capacity to hold 5,000 Confederate soldiers, but with the breakdown of the prisoner exchange system and more prisoners being taken as the conflict continued, it started to become overcrowded. Very quickly, there were almost 10,000 men crammed inside the prison walls. Locals could not resist being curious about the site, and it wasn't long before someone capitalised on it. Two observatories were constructed across the road from the prison, and for 15 cents, a sightseer could climb to the top of the tower, sit with some peanuts and lemonade, and observe the inmates. The prisoners soon realised they were being spied upon, and being bored and at loose end, started devising antics to play up to the audience. Some prisoners would juggle or perform acrobats to impress, but also deride the lofty spectators. 
the guards soon dismantled one of the towers while people started to realise that they were paying to watch men waste away as disease swept through the camp. While the audiences continued to turn out and pay their nickel and dime, a quarter of the prisoners perished due to insanitary conditions. Santa Claus. By 1863, life in the South had become unbearable due to Union blockades. Prices were sky high and families had difficulties affording even basic food items. With Christmas imminent, parents realised that they were unable to buy presents for their children. They had to think up some kind of an explanation and sometimes these were cruel. Some parents informed their children that Santa Claus had been prevented from coming because he had been ambushed by Yankee troops. Other parents were a bit more humane and said that Santa couldn't get through the Union blockade. Some children may have been quite scarred. In one memoir, a woman wrote that, as a small girl during the Civil War, she would gaze at maps for hours, trying to walk out a path for Santa Claus to use to get through the blockade. University Greys At the start of the Civil War, the University of Mississippi had 139 students. Of these, 135 enlisted to serve in the Confederate Army. The school building was used as a war hospital, and all but four members of its student body gathered together to form Company A of the 11th Mississippi. Unfortunately, not a single member of the company nicknamed the University Greys returned from the war unharmed. The company had a rare 100% casualty rate, with every man either returning injured or not at all. The Greys had been scheduled to fight in the first Battle of Bull Run. However, the train was delayed and most of them didn't reach the battlefront. Even without fighting, the Colonel Moore became one of the company's first casualties by accidentally blasting his own foot. The remaining group continued to fight and almost made it to the end. It was the final day of the Battle of Gettysburg when the Greys merged with a reckless charge against the Union soldiers. Of the Confederate men involved, half perished, and not a single student from the University of Mississippi survived the clash. The Snow Fight One morning in 1864, Confederate Army troops awoke to find 13 centimetres or 5 inches of snow around them. The excited soldiers, many as young as 17 years, rushed outside and fought what is probably the biggest snowball fight on record, involving up to 20,000 men. The Tennessee and Georgian soldiers sped up into two teams, built up piles of snowballs and advanced at each other. On Tennessee's side, Colonel Gordon even joined in on horseback, waving a dirty handkerchief like a flag and tossing snowballs at his men. Other exchanges broke out among the Confederate forces as men lined up and used their strategic military training to launch a barrage of snowballs at the other side. Some men who ventured too close to the enemy lines were dragged away to have their shirts filled with snow. As the snow cleared, the men hoisted their weapons again and headed for the next battle their snowplay downtime having temporarily relieved the horrors of war. <laughs>